Welcome to the first lecture of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today I'm going to give you an overview of the New and Old Testaments and we're going to talk about that about 400-430 year blank period in between the ending of the Old Testament in Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament of Matthew. If you follow along in your notes, you'll notice in the introductory paragraph it says that the purpose of this course is to provide you with a foundational understanding of each book in the New Testament and to survey the contents of each book. However, if we are going to be able to understand the New Testament, then it is vital to first understand the world in which these books were written. Paul wrote to the church of Galatia in Galatians 4.4 that God sent forth his son at the perfect point in history. Well, if that is the case, then let's get a better understanding of the time frame that Jesus lived in. So Roman number one, let's talk about an overview of the Testaments. The first part of our Bible is called the Old Testament. Now within the Old Testament, there are 39 books, 39 books. Interestingly, these 39 books were written by a great number of people over a long period of time. And number two, they were mostly written in a language called Hebrew, with a few portions in Aramaic. And if you look in your notes here, you can see Ezra, Daniel, and Jeremiah have a few verses. In fact, Jeremiah has only has one verse. But Ezra and Daniel have several verses and passages that are specifically in a different dialect of Hebrew. Hebrew called Aramaic. It is a different language than Hebrew. However, it is so closely associated with Hebrew that if you learn Hebrew, it's very easy to understand and to learn Aramaic. Number three, it focuses primarily upon the nation of Israel. And if you look at this picture on the slide, that little bitty red spot right there in the middle is the nation of Israel. A very small place, but an extremely significant part of both history and even today. Number four. The Old Testament is divided into three parts. The first part is called the Torah, and Torah is Hebrew for law. Those first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all part of that Pentateuch, five books known as the law. Then you have what's called the Nivaim. Now the Nivaim is the Hebrew word for the prophets. And then finally is the Kittuvim which is the writings. If you look in your notes at the listing of the Nevi'im and the Kitavim, you'll notice that the Hebrew Bible is not laid out in the same way that our traditional English Bibles are laid out. In fact, if you look at the listing there in the prophets, Joshua, Judges, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings are listed in there, whereas with ours, we put that in the beginning with the writing section. Now, that is not to say that we're right and they're wrong. In fact, it is their book, and they probably have it laid out in a much more logical way than we do. However, we kind of just decided for different reasons um, to, be, to put them in a dissimilar fashion than the Old Testament Hebrew Bible. Now that we've talked about the Old Testament, let's move to the New Testament. The New Testament is made up of 27 books. Now these 27 books cover approximately 50 years. Now whereas the Old Testament covered over a thousand years of Hebrew history, the New Testament only covers about 50 years. And there are at least eight authors. Now nine if Paul is not the author of Hebrews. And there is a lot of debate over that. In fact, we do not know for sure who wrote the letter of to the to the Hebrews that we commonly just call Hebrews. However, there are at least eight authors. Letter A, Paul wrote the most. He wrote 13 epistles or letters. Now, 14 if you wrote Hebrews. Letter B, John wrote 5. The Gospel of John 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. See, Luke wrote two. And some of you may be thinking, wait a second, I thought there was only one gospel of Luke. That is correct. But the book of Acts was actually written by Luke as well. 
And then letter D, Peter wrote to. This one's easy. First and second Peter, attributed to him, named after him. And then lastly, Matthew, Mark, James, Jude, and the author of Hebrews each wrote one. Now the James here and the Jude are interesting to point out because when we get to them, we'll, we'll study them a little bit more in detail, but they were actually half-brothers of Jesus. Number four, we believe that all of the writers of the New Testament were Jews except for Luke. Now this is significant because if this is true, then it's significant because Jesus chose a non-Jew as an, to write an inspired portion of our scripture. If there's anything we've learned about Jewish history is that they were very um, inclusive of only their people. They did not welcome outsiders as much as they should have. And for Jesus to welcome an outsider into his fold, which he did multiple times throughout the New Testament, shows that he was countercultural to the, to the belief system that countries and people groups should only stick together. Then number five, whereas the Old Testament was written in uh, Hebrew with a few portions in Aramaic, the New Testament was written in a language called Greek, and that is a, a copy of a portion of scripture right there in the Greek language. Then number six, the New Testament focuses primarily on the formation and the growth of the church. Now this one is one of my favorite aspects of the New Testament because the Old Testament focused on a people group, one people group, and one location, whereas the New Testament focuses on every people group and every location. In fact, Paul writes several, several places that it is not about where you were born and who you were born from. It's about us all being one in the body of Christ. And then number seven, just like the Old Testament is divided into three parts, so is the New Testament. Here's how we lay out the New Testament. The first section is called the history. That's where we get Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Matthew through John are a historical account of Jesus Christ. Acts is a historical account of the Holy Spirit's ministry through the apostles in the formation of the church and the development of it and how it spread throughout the entire world. Then letter B are the epistles. Now the word epistle is just a big word for letter. So literally it's the letters. And if you look there, that's Romans all the way through Jude. And those can be subdivided into general epistles, Pauline epistles, prison epistles, those are the ones that Paul wrote when he was in prison, pastoral epistles, the ones that Paul wrote to pastors. So they can be subdivided into different sections. But as a whole, the major group is called the epistles or the letters. And then lastly, is the prophecy. And there's only one Old Testament, or excuse me, New Testament book that is categorized as prophetic, and that is the book of Revelation. Now, that is not to say that there's not prophetic undertones and even direct passages of prophecy in the other epistles and letters, but Revelation is specifically a prophetic book for the church today. Now that we've discussed an overview of the, of the Testaments, we've talked about the Old Testament, we've talked about the New Testament, now let's talk about that time period between the Testaments. And this part is extremely important because when you end the book of Malachi, you've got one people group in charge. And then when you start back in Matthew, all of a sudden a different people group is in charge of Israel. So what happened? Letter A. The Old Testament ends, the book of Malachi, with Israel under the rule of Persia. Now, as I said before, there's about a 400 to 430 year period between Malachi and Matthew where we do not have inspired scriptures. In fact, that was a part of God's plan where he was withholding speaking to his people because of their disobedience until Jesus came as the, that great spokesman from God, obviously, as God himself. Now, the book of Malachi is when the people of God, Israel, is under the rule of Persia. But there's a few things we need to, to focus on before we even really understand the Persian people. And if you see this picture here on the slide, this is what's known as the Medo-Persian Empire. The Persian Empire was made up of two major people groups, the Medes and the Persians. Now we commonly just call it the Persian Empire, but it's the Medo-Persian Empire. And you can see the vast territory that they conquered and took over. 
But before we get into more detail of the Persian Empire, we need to talk about the Babylonian Empire. Because before the Persians took over the Babylonians, the Babylonians took over Israel. So let's talk about a few things about Israel underneath the Babylonian rule. Letter A, while under Babylonian rule, synagogues were initiated. Now, the reason why this was even done was because when Babylon went into Israel and took over, they destroyed the city of Jerusalem and they destroyed the temple. So without Jerusalem, without the temple, and the people, the people scattered throughout the nation of Babylon, there was no priesthood in operation. So the Jews needed a place to worship the Lord. The synagogues provided that place for them to worship God all throughout the world. And these meeting places, these synagogues, were even very instrumental in the spread of the gospel in the book of Acts. Then letter B, scribes became the religious leaders. Like I said, the priests were inoperable because there was no temple. So the people that became religious leaders are the individuals whose job was to copy the Old Testament hand by hand. They did not have printing machines. The Gutenberg press had not been developed yet. So they by hand would copy line from line, word for word. And then letter C, the Jews were scattered everywhere. And this was one of the uh, thought process that Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian people had was when they took over a nation, they didn't let the people stay where they were. He took them and scattered them and took them back to Babylon and put them in other places as a way to strip them of any kind of national pride they might have. Then number two, Babylon fell to Cyrus, king of Persia. So now we get to where we began in that Persian empire in the book of Malachi. So Babylon fell to a man named Cyrus. And interestingly, Cyrus was prophesied of in the book of Isaiah as being the man that would take over Babylon. So let's look at a few things about that pertaining to Persia. Letter A. Persia actually allowed the Jews to return to Israel and rebuild Jerusalem, its walls, and its temple. Whereas Nebuchadnezzar took the people out of Israel and Jerusalem, Persia allowed them to return. And not only that, but number two, that's when Hebrew began to be replaced by the language called Aramaic. Now, as you can see down here, it probably looks very similar to that graphic I showed you earlier about Hebrew. They are very similar languages. They're not the same, but they are very similar languages. And if you learn Hebrew, it's very easy to learn Ar Aramaic. Then number three. Persia did eventually fall to the nation of Greece underneath Alexander the Great's rule. Now, Alexander the Great was the king of a place called Macedon, which is the island of Greece. Now, if you notice, if you look at this map of the Greek Empire, it was vast and large, and that was mostly accomplished during the time of Alexander the Great. He led men into battle for 15 years, and rumor is, tradition is, that he never lost a battle. But he wasn't just a, a general, a leader who led his people from the back. He actually led them in the front lines, and in fact, he suffered many times at the hands of the enemy while he was fighting in these wars. And he probably could have conquered even more, but tradition tells us that his men got homesick, they wanted to go back home, and he allowed them to. He did eventually die at the young age of 30 under mysterious conditions. Then number four, Greece fell to the Romans at the Battle of Corinth. The Romans attacked and defeated the Greeks at the Battle of Corinth in 146 BC. But interestingly enough, they loved the Greek culture, including their language so much that they actually integrated it within their own society. And then, 100 years later, the Roman Empire officially began in 27 BC, which leads us perfectly to letter B. 
the New Testament begins with Israel under the rule of Rome, which is modern-day Italy today. And as you can see in that map right there, they were another massive empire that ruled the world at, at a certain time. And this is the empire that Jesus was born into. He was born into or in Israel in Bethlehem underneath the rule of that country, that empire called Rome. Well, that concludes the information for Lecture 1 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me because I'm here for you if you need me.